Hello, um, this is a presentation I made for the Wigan Local History and Heritage uh, Society in July 22 about brass bands and Wigan and uh, not being a brass band expert or uh, a historian for that matter. Um, I kind of went about it and uh, <clears throat> tried to find a connection and, and really find it a little bit about um, brass bands, the whole movement and how that came about. And, um, and Wigan's part in it. So, you know, the question I had was, you know, is brass band still of any real interest to people, um, you know, apart from those who play? So I'll jump into the presentation now. And um, yeah, let's see what you think. So this, uh, this happened just the other month. So that was um, <clears throat> that was in Saddleworth at uh, Delft, and that was Chav Brass, who probably won't be winning any national competitions, but certainly won the crowd on the day. Um, uh, anyway, punching above its weight, I thought um, a little bit about Wigan's part in the brass band movement. And what's interesting, you know, I, I think anyone in Wigan of an age, certain age, would be pretty familiar with brass bands. You know, we, we all remember walking days, we remember them <clears throat> in Mains Park at the bandstand and also, you know, the Queen's Hall and other places where there were numerous kind of concerts. We also <clears throat> had bands around at Christmas time playing carols. We had them, you know, they're, they're the sound that, that connects kind of the, the community. It, you know, I always think about when I hear a brass band, I think it's it's the sound of that uh, community that's that coming together. And, uh, you know, what I, what, what I think most people's experience of is that if the band turns up, it's a pretty good thing. But I kind of had a question about, like, you know, why, why did this kind, why did it even kind of happen? Um, and before getting into, like, Wigan and Wigan's part, to understand a little bit about the, the kind of the genesis, if you like, of, uh, of the brass band movement. So what I'd like to do is talk a little bit about, um, <clears throat> you know, some of the things I discovered around this area. You know, and I call this like the sound of positive change. And um, it's kind of interesting, you know, the, this came out of the backdrop of the Industrial Revolution. And revolution and industrial revolution, it was huge change, unprecedented change, not only in the way people work, but it subsequently the way they lived. And those two, those two things came clashing together, if you like, at some point to create an opportunity where, where brass bands could naturally kind of pick up on and, and go forward with. Firstly, you know, with with the industrial side of things came technological advancement. Um, you know, there, there is no doubt that industry, you know, it, it became as we moved over from manpower to machine power, um, there were, there was much innovation and, you know, it, it, this idea that it's journey from the factory floor is based on the fact that, you know, we, we tend to develop technologies and things for one thing, but ultimately they, they live and exist in, in other ways. You know, like an example being tinfoil, you know, NASA's developing this for a, a lunar landing device, which was incredibly light, but had a structure. And now tinfoil is generally found wrapped around turkeys in ovens and stuff. So, you know, it's found its kind of home in the end. Um, the, the, the three kind of technologies, I think, which <clears throat> kind of really are important to, uh, to, to the brass, bass, uh, brass band movement, or, or brass and the brass industry for sure, steam power and railway. Now the brass industry was, was kind of interesting because it really started to come into its own around 1832. You know, but with brass and bronze has been made for forever, but brass was a relatively kind of new variant of this. 
and they really perfected it. it they, they had kind of centres around Cheadle, then in Warrington, then they moved down to Bristol for a spell, but they landed in, uh, in Birmingham. <clears throat> and the Birmingham brass industry is, is you know, as powerful and as, as important as uh, Sheffield Steel in that respect. So they got they figured out how to how to to produce this with steam power came something else which was just their ability to to produce a lot more of it faster which is good for us and brass because that meant that there was a lot more brass available and because of the economies of scale the the, the price became much more uh, competitive and realistic that steam power then kind of transferred into into rail and the railways. Uh, incidentally, the image you see is the uh, Manchester to Liverpool, which was the world's first intercity rail line, um, and that was around 1830. Um, and this connected with Wigan, but this idea of connecting was really important because bands literally could not travel. You know, there was no bus service, there was no service at all. So, you know, distances between Coppel and, and Platte Bridge were, were, were problematic. And, you know, whenever bands travelled to compete or to, to in, uh, in concerts, they were literally, uh, it was a bit of a lottery whether they all turned up, uh, uh, certainly on time, but uh, as one band. And this was a real uh, this was a real issue that the railway started to help uh, to overcome, and by connecting, not only with places but the people from places could connect with each other, and that was very big as far as the the contests were concerned. <clears throat> the other industrial revolution innovation was um, was instrumentation. Um, you know, we'd had the orchestras for quite some time, which was a combination, as you know, of woodwind, string and, and brass and uh, and percussive. Um, as far as the instruments that were around, they were, <clears throat> they were numerous, they were complex, they were hard to play and um, very unreliable in terms of their, uh, their consistency. So, you know, th things like the bugle and the serpent and the French horn, uh, they, they were just difficult for, for a very good player to play, let alone people who had never been near an instrument. So we needed something which would kind of help us in that area. And this guy, Adolf Sax, um, was a guy from Belgium, probably best known for the saxophone. However, for, <clears throat> for our story, he, he invented something far more important. Um, he was actually living in Belgium when the, um, when the French uh, military contacted him and asked him to go over to Paris because the, the French armed forces were a little concerned that the German armed forces had better bands than the French and needed his help. So, uh, you know, which I think is, is quite a fun, a fun reason to get him over. So what he, what he actually did, he, he, um, he invented the sax horn system and these look, will look very, very familiar, unlike the last ones we saw. Um, what, he, what he actually did, he created a system twofold. One was the, uh, he created a range, a, 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 almost if you like, a, a library of instruments that um, could achieve the kind of range of sounds that would be required to perform uh, any musical piece, starting with the smallest one being the cornet and working its way up to the tuba. He also introduced valves, which are the three finger valves that you see, which were infinitely easy to easier to play, not easy to play, but easier to play. Um, uh, and this made it a lot more accessible as an instrument to learn for people who were coming at this with no prior, um, with no prior musical training uh, uh, at all. The other important thing about this system was, you know, arguably if you could play one, you could play them all, probably not all very well, but certainly you could transfer between instruments, which was really important um, because people moved around from bands, people got injured in pits and mines and you know and uh, and mills so you know it was it was very smart and and, it, and I, maybe it was not an intent in, an intentional thing but certainly um because of the fluid nature of, of bands colliery bands etc then 
um, this proved to be really beneficial and uh, and help keep uh, keep bands together. Um, so this was a really really big step for 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 the brass band. <clears throat> Um, another big step was not only the fact <clears throat> that Adolf Sachs had kind of invented these things, but um, they need people needed to be aware of it. And the Distin family um, saw to that. They were a travelling bunch of musicians who picked up on the saxophone system and started to play. <clears throat> they also um, they also were connected directly with Adolf Sachs in terms of distribution of these instruments and subsequently their own label as it were as they made minor modifications to these and then sold these as distant instruments um and you, you know to 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 actually get people away from what they were used to playing and what they thought was you know a a, a, a the right ensemble or and to get them into the saxon system <clears throat> not only did they go around and play but they also made them available um through gifting and competition so this this little thing that's popped up is the um, this is the prizes to the winners of the first national championship at uh, Crystal Palace in 1900. So apart from the 40 pounds in money, which was won by Black Dyke Band on the day, um, they were also uh, they also won a, a silver cup for the bandmaster and a magnificent champion contrabass in E flat, with a value of 35 guineas that was presented by Mr. Henry Distin. So you can see getting. These these instruments in the hands of the best players made the all, all the other bands um, really want to kind of follow suit. Then there was Boosie and Besson. So as, as this thing is beginning to standardise and take shape, Boosies were, were providing instruments, but also sheet music. They were the big company and still are even today. Boosie are are uh, go to go to people for uh, for musical manuscripts, mainly classical now. And Besson, Besson was one of the the big the big uh, manufacturers of brass instruments. And you can see from this ad advertisement from the uh, Brass Band World paper of nineteen ten that uh, they were quite smart in their advertising as well by showing that the winning bands were all using Besson instruments, which is. <clears throat> which is a technique which it survives today. You'll also see on this that um, after the band name, you will see the conductor. And the person who conducted the three winning bands in this particular year is a man called W. Halliwell, which we will talk a little bit more about uh, uh, a little bit later on. So that was, you know, that's really this industrial revolution, the 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 the, the hard side of it to some extent, the uh, the technologies and the, the hardware, but there's there's a soft side to this as well, which is the industrial revolution created a, a societal change and uh, and what I've called a beautiful rage against the machine here, and this was really. Um, the artists of the day, the writers, the painters, the musicians, composers, uh, even the architects, kind of they 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 kind of started to reject what has been a very classic period uh, in in art, um, and one they moved into into you know what we now know as uh, as romanticism. And with Romanticism, which was a kind of a, an artistic backlash, if you like, to, <clears throat> to industrialization, to the order and the classic nature of what had gone before, which was very, very formula driven, very much based in the Greek and Roman style, very biblical in the way it, uh, it, it was presented. The Romantics chose to look at things which were a lot more accessible like nature like folklore um like nationalism and uh, you know out of this came the new the new breed of artists like um constable like the bronte sisters and and from our point of view in the uh, musical world we had um elgar and uh, and verdi uh, strauss um and and we also had the you know the uh the new breed as well coming through from Chopin's and uh, and Wagner's, all all celebrating a very different kind of thing than this traditional, you know, art uh, uh, art and music based uh, 
in a much more formula formula driven way and because of this you know the, the writing went from the hero story to relationships and and people and every day and uh, and you know the working class could could more easily uh connect uh, and enjoy you know the 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 woodland scenes of constable than you know the very dramatic kind of biblical paintings of old which were you know all set in in a very a, a very old old school way and kind of that viewed through a very uh, a very different lens of knowledge and understanding and exclusivity to to things which had been very much the you know the 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 realm of the uh, of the upper class and at the same time we saw um, um, some other things happen which which were really important in terms of um, of the working class specifically beginning to embrace uh, and actually hear music to be honest um this there was a french guy louis antoine julien who was in london between 1840 and 1856 he'd come over from paris and what was happening in paris you know because this isn't that long after the revolution is they they kind of liberated classical music from the opera houses um and uh you know uh, they'd got this style of playing music and, and concerts and performances, uh, which were like the promenade, uh, the promenade style uh, of, of delivery, which is uh, mainly outdoors, literally on promenades in, in parks and in open spaces and taking music out of, out of the kind of the stuffiness of the opera houses and, um, <clears throat> and, and bringing it out, out to the people. So, so you know, Louis Antoine would be, you know, be it would be a lot more um, uh, kind of art, articulate uh, uh, and uh, and rather, you know, rather entertaining in his delivery of not necessarily classical music, but more the quadrilles, the polkas, the waltzes, and and very much a celebration of that popular music, which more people could connect with a lot easier. So in doing this, he he really did, he, he, you know, probably uh, without w without trying, but he certainly uh, this kind of entertainment entertaining approach to to musical delivery, which was the start of the proms. Um, um, but he, he he probably kind of made a play and created a demand for more places to hear music and i think subsequently music halls and other venues started to appear where more people could go and enjoy more music um sadly he ended up um back in france and um and in a, an, a, an asylum in the end um but a, a very very interesting and very important uh, chap nonetheless <clears throat> the with all of this you know when we talk about um not you know the north of England, the working class, and we you know, this period of time, you know there was a, a dramatic shift in people's lives within the nineteenth century. You know it it was horrific for most of them at the uh, the turn of the nineteenth century, uh, and you know things like the Peterloo massacre are one example of that. But this desire and this fight for for change and and for a, a more fair, uh, a more fairer kind of world, you know, began to pay off, you know, and it took it took a lot of time, but um, you know the 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 reform act of eighteen thirty two really did kind of um, make a point about about um, being listened to. Whilst it didn't really give much, it did give parliamentary representation, which kind of was was playing a part in the background and 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 you know it really did it really did give us the opportunity as a working class to uh to better to better our lives so in 1838 with queen victoria's coronation there was a huge sense of optimism as well as we saw you know the end of uh Mad king george and uh and uh you know his his children who didn't really have much interest in helping uh, anyone else's cause. And by 1871, the Trade Unions Act um, 
was was declared, and this this was massive. In, within this period, uh, you know, there are, there are certain scholars who who would argue that the the average working class wage doubled, um, you know, within this period, and and not not only did they now have something um, in the form of the Trades Unions Act, they actually could stop fighting. You know, working hard is one thing, having a tough life is another, and constantly fighting to make it better. And at some point, the fight, you know, could people could kind of relax a little bit and enjoy what, what had actually happened. And you'll see that many of the bans came after the 1871 Trade Unions Act, so there, there must be some, some correlation with that. This next section really is <clears throat> kind of the, the brass band movement and, you know, the birth of it. And there are three important things about this. One is concerts, the other is converts, and the, the, the third is contest. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about each. The concerts, basically bands were everywhere. It's been estimated there were over 20,000 bands existed in the British Isles. Over 2,000 of these were sponsored by industry. And by industry, I mean collieries, uh, uh, mills, the railway, uh, steel, steel and, uh, and, and engineering companies. And they, they, they themselves had 2,000. The other 18,000 were a combination of maybe church, um, uh, local community bands, town village bands. Um, and interestingly enough, Another two thousand were um, um, in the hands of uh, the temperance movement, which is an astonishing number of bands when you consider it. Wigan itself had many, many temperance bands, but they were funding these, which were not. Uh, it was it was not insignificant, you know, get, the, pulling together the money to 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 buy instruments, to to have places to. To, to practice, to uniforms, all these things. <clears throat> you know, so there was a lot involved in the temperance movement. Um, I think what they, what the, one of the reasons that they, they, they got into this, but the, the, the brass bands was one, because they were noisy and they could travel and they could herald the movement in, in, in many ways. I think importantly, banding and banders reflected kind of discipline, civility, commitment, and all of these are virtues which they could align themselves with, um, as did the Vimto brand, which became the drink of the teetotalers, the total abstainers. Uh, and um, uh, yeah, this was, uh, this be became the drink of choice. But the other thing about, um, about having a band, because everybody would go and see the band, and therefore, when the people arrive, you had <clears throat> you had the opportunity to get uh, all these people gathered to make the pledge and and jump on the wagon with you. So it was um, it was a, a powerful tool for them. There's a story of um, the uh, Lower Inch Temperance Prize Band um, conducted by uh, Mr. Alsop here, and um, he. Uh, was a colliery man, but as he were, when he was leading the band, he wrote a <clears throat> a march, uh, which apparently was so difficult to play, that um, the uh, <clears throat> the boozes of this world wouldn't actually print it up. So he wrote it out um, for each of the instruments, <clears throat> got the band to to learn it, and uh, and then performed it in uh, Mains Park in Wigan. Um, to an audience of over 15,000 joyous people. So you see like the pull of the band and uh, no surprise the temperance movement uh, did capitalize on this. And uh, <clears throat> you know, that, uh, that was a big part of it because they, they really did get a lot of bands up and going. Many of them incidentally dropped temperance at some point <clears throat> because um, it's thirsty work, isn't it, blowing? So I think a lot of them were kind of uh, really, they were initially funded by them, but I think at some point just for the sake of hypocrisy, they had to just kind of lose the name, um, but they did continue. <clears throat> and finally, contests. If one thing has um, secured the, uh, 
the the future of, of brass banding and even the the dawn of it <coughs> excuse me it's contests um because the competitiveness is is kind of what what banders really really are in it for i i, I thoroughly believe that and we have two two national um two national contests which which were the things to win the British Open, which kicked off in Bellevue in 1853, and the national championships, which uh, kicked off at Crystal Palace in 1900. Now, interesting, this is very much a North and South thing. If you, I think I ask any Northern bandsman which is the one to win, and they will say, hands down, the British Open, the national championships were opened up later to kind of... Uh, you know, get more, more, more of the South involved in it, as it was very much dominated by Northern bands, um, and uh, and and these really were significant, uh, because the the idea that we will be number one in the country and we will beat all of those Yorkshiremen or all of those Lancashiremen was was really significant. Interestingly, to get to these, you know, you had to win local. Um, contests and regional contests. Uh, this is a, uh, a an extract from a Platte Bridge contest in a, probably about 1903, something like that. And it's a, it's just talking a little bit about the weather, but it's um, but it's talking about also um, the the importance. Every single local, regional, and national championship contest was covered monthly. Um, this one was in Platte Bridge. The next one was. Uh, from Wigan, and this was the the first Wigan and District Brass Band Association um, held the, their first contest at West Horn, um, uh in the Wakes weeks. So, and and this particular um, journalist or writer, whoever was uh, was more interested in the fact that he wasn't quite he wasn't quite sure um, uh, about the the judging and the uh, the honesty of the judging on the day and something that uh, I think he wanted to make a bit of a thing about. But, uh, you know, there you go. So, you know, we had all these things come together. <clears throat> and um, it, 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 we had the, the scene, we had the instruments, we had the desire, we, we'd found the money somewhere. Um, but there was an appetite, there was time, and and there was a reason, many reasons, whether that was because you wanted to drive your agenda uh, from a, a drinking point of view, or you wanted to promote your uh, your mill or your colliery, um, or just simply for, for the love of it. But what it needed was then people who could really, really make it a thing in itself. Uh, you have to remember that most people who started in brass bands had never picked up an instrument, didn't read music, and probably didn't have a, an extensive knowledge or catalogue of uh, of the music um, that, that had been composed up to then, particularly the classical music. So um, we needed some titans to really take it forward. <clears throat> the first one, um, is I think you know I refer to him as the Godfather, John Gladney Jr., who was arguably the architect of the the modern day brass band. He he has conducted more more wins uh, in the national championships than anyone winning the British Open nineteen times as conductor for many many different bands. Um, but I think what's important about him is that he. He tried to standardize what a band was, you know, how many of these instruments should we have? How many of these, you know, where do they sit? What, what is the position and things? And, and he, he did kind of do a lot of work around what is now a standard setup for, for a brass band. And, and what's, you know, it's all, everything's good reflectively, but getting to this point, which was really important because you can't, write music for a brass band arguably until you know what instruments are in there and the combination of them and uh, subsequently you know how will all of those work together and what part will each of them play 
So he did a lot of he, he did a lot of that early work around around the bands and the band in itself. Um, importantly for us, um, he got um, he got involved with Pemberton Old band um, between nineteen o two and ninety seven and nineteen o seven. He gave Pemberton Old band the greatest successes in the British Open Championship. So, you know, you look at this, including one first place in nineteen o three, playing Caractacus. Um, was absolutely magnificent and you see in the two second places as well two six places and uh, maybe in 1901 or 1908 I think they got another one if you get within the first six basically you know that's considered uh, a winning place but uh, the first was absolutely fantastic um, so you know his involvement with with Pemberton all as I mentioned earlier can make a significant difference to bands um, the, incidentally, this was the one of the judges' uh, comments on uh, on, on Pemberton's um, performance on the day, <clears throat> which I'll, I'll I'll probably not read it out, but uh, it was a glowing uh, a glowing report of uh, of a truly excellent performance. The other titan I want to mention is um, is William Rimmer. William Rimmer uh, was from Southport. Um, he was a solo cornet player, composer, trainer, uh, and conductor. Um, he, he he's called King of the Marches because that's exactly what he was. He he, he wrote by far the best marches for 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 bands, um, <clears throat> and indeed military bands as well. But he had an affection for a couple of bands in Wigan, which were Crook Band and Pemberton Old. Um, he first got involved with uh, Pem uh, with Crook Band in about 1894 um, uh, through 1906, uh, and uh, really significantly raised the standard. You know, th these people were teachers. It wasn't just about um, uh, about learning to play one piece of music. It it was everything about how you play together. What uh, you know, some of the skills and some of the subtleties and nuances. Um, he then moved and did a lot of work with Pemberton Hall between 1894 and 1902 um, <clears throat> and was probably, you know, very much responsible for getting them to that standard um, by which they could win the Nationals in 1903 under the baton of John, John Gladney. Um, <clears throat> but something else about William Rimmer, which I think is, is, is really kind of connects beautifully with Wigan is that he wrote a march and he gifted he gifted this march to Pemberton Old Band and one of his best marches in my opinion um, and um, this is um, it was a it was a, a, a march called Punchinello and it is um, it now belongs to Pemberton Old Band um, and I'll play you some of this um, the the particular recording you're going to hear is uh, is is another nice connection because it's actually performed on this occasion. It was a 1940s recording um, by Bickershaw Colliery Band under the um, baton of William Haydock, and we'll speak a little bit more about those later. But this is um, Punchinella, which was, uh, as I mentioned, written by William Rimmer for Pemberton Old Band. <laughs> Thank you. 
So that's Ponchinello, fabulous. Um, Mr. Halliwell. So Mr. Halliwell, if you remember, I pointed him out on uh, the um, Besson advertisement in the, uh, the the brass band world of 1910. He um, he was prolific. I'd never even heard of him until I started doing this, but he is really one of Wigan's true unsung heroes. It's William Halliwell, MVO, born in Roby Mill. And uh, I think he grew up like wanting to be an organist uh, in the church, but he, he, he kind of fell in love with bands and joined the uh, uh, Apollon Temperance Band, first of all. But it, it, he's as a teacher, as a an adjudicator, a judge, he was basically second to none. Um, he won 17 first prizes in the national championships as a conductor, 13 second prizes, 12 third, 6 fourth, 6 fifth and 11 six prizes. Um, truly, you know, truly on a par uh, with, with John Gladney in terms of his successes and very much in demand. Um, you know, from bands not only in in Wigan but uh, but around the around the UK, also you know conducted for um, King George V and Queen Mary on several occasions uh, with different bands. Uh, one of one of those occasions at uh, Buckingham Palace, um, but he was known to miners and monarchy alike as Mister Halliwell, a very unassuming, uh, um, incredibly talented man. Um, one of the busiest man, men in brass. Uh, this is just that some of the bands that he taught and led um, from Apoll and Temperance bands. He was solo cornet player with Wigan Orchestral Society, trumpet with the Choral Society, solo cornet with Wigan Rifles Band, who he had a long association until they kind of they kind of filtered out a little bit into um, into Pemberton Old, and then he, he started to get involved with them. Along the way, uh, Coppel, Bickershaw, Aspel, Atherton and Platte Bridge. Uh, on the right hand side, you'll see he used to regularly run an advertisement in uh, in Right and Round's Brass Band News um, for as a teacher and adjudicator. And that's Mr. Hat William Halliwell at 320 Springbank, Pemberton, Wigan. Um, he was one of the very few people, I think, at the time to, to actually have a car, I, I, I have heard. Um, which probably allowed him to get around to numerous bands everywhere. He literally was was looking after multiple bands at the same time, as well as conducting in uh, and judging in in major competitions. What, it, what I what I found the um, the original um, program from the nineteen o three Bellevue Championship when uh, when Pemberton all won it. And it was interesting to see that uh, William Halliwell was was conducting a, a number of bands at the time. You see, on the on the right side, he was conducting Wigan Rifles, and there we get a list of all the players and uh, <clears throat> and funnily enough, where they lived. Um, he also was conducting for I think Couple, yeah. So with Couple subscription, so these documents and these were all part of a Roy, the Roy Newsom collection at uh, Salford University which was um, a fabulous source. Yeah, I think he had every programme and every copy of Brass Band News uh, ever published. So that was a, a really good source of, uh, of information when I was putting this together. <clears throat> I mentioned uh, that he'd, he'd, he'd been involved with many Wigan bands, but if you, if you know anything about banding, uh, this list reads like the who's who of bands and uh, and he's led all of these to some kind of victory including Foden's Engineering, Black Dyke, Hebden Bridge, Wingate's Temperance, Bessie's of the Barn, Brighouse and Rastrick, um, you know, so he's he shared his talents and his skills almost everywhere. I'm, 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 ch I'm sure he charged, but you know, the, the point is uh, he made good bands great. So it was a pretty quiet man as well, outside of banding. But uh, this was an extract from <clears throat> a talk that he was uh, he was kind of asked to give at the uh, Wigan Rotary Club, um, and um, you know it, it's interesting that it, he he really did want to impart and and gift his passion 
<clears throat> for music. And he was talking about the working class, not in a detrimental way, you know, far from it. But his point was that, you know, people who live in noisy surroundings, down the pit in engineering shops and factories, and in many cases, even in their own homes, so that the tone of a piano or a reed or a string instrument seems kind of a puny and effeminate thing, while that of a brass instrument is commanding, arresting and compelling. But these same people under favourable conditions and training learn to love quiet tone as well as loud. And I think that's very true, just knowing... Uh, you know, knowing my dad and my dad's appreciation of it, he was a fitter at Heinz, you know, in a very, very noisy surroundings, but uh, but uh, he was a very different person when listening to music. And, uh, you know, so the, 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 he was a pretty, pretty special, very influential guy. And, um, you know, I think a Wigginer who made a, a, an enormous contribution to the brass band movement. Um, <clears throat> we'll kind of finish off with a few more um, stars um, and players, you know, specifically from Wigan. So the King of Trombones, this is Harold Moss. Um, no re no re relation as far as I know, um, but he was another, another man who made a considerable contribution to brass. He's um, fa fabulous trombone player, conductor and composer and adjudicator as well, uh, very much in demand, uh, judging at contests. Um, and he made his mark in Wigan and, um, you know, and, and in the banding world in the first half of the uh, first half of the 20th century. He, um, he had a very, very successful career at Wingate's Temperance Band between 1909 and 1936, winning the Nationals in 1931. He then moved to uh, Cresswell Colliery, pictured here. Um, and in 1946, not only did he win the national championships with the trombone quartet, uh, but also the world championships. Um, he finished his career conducting at Leyland Motors and um, was also a composer. And one of his, probably his most famous piece was The Nightingale, which is a true test of any cornet player. Um, and yeah, we'll have a yeah, we'll have a, a little listen to this. So yeah, lovely. I think he, I think he actually wrote that for his, um, for his wife, if I'm not mistaken. But um, I'm happy to be uh, happy to be challenged on that. Um, okay, Harry Bentham, um, seventy six years of banding, quite phenomenal. Uh, another Wigan chap. Um, he started playing at the age of eight at uh, Copple Band, and uh, by the age of fourteen, he was the 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 soloist, um, which is kind of phenomenal achievement um he when the war broke out um i think he left there and uh, was too young to go into the forces and uh, moved over to horwich band with um quite a lot of the younger players at that time um and after that he moved on to leyland motors um uh he did 
a lot for a lot of uh, a lot of bands around here. He went back to Koppel as musical director in 1955 and uh, brought them into the second section, which was really, a, you know, I mean, it's like it's the equivalent of like, you know, a good manager in football, you know, really bringing them up the divisions and did a really good job with uh, <clears throat> with Koppel. Then his, ta his talents were requested at Hay Band. And in 1956, he moved there and uh, he secured a championship win in, in the Grand Shield. Um, after Hay, he moved to uh, Wigan <clears throat> Boys Club Band and took some some fine players with him. A um, lot of Withingtons, but uh, the, the players he favoured who helped him to even more success with Wigan Boys Club Band are Len Withington, Jack Withington, John Withington, Alan Withington, Gordon Clough, Keith Hollinshead and John Maines. Um, and uh, he was there for quite some time until 74 years after beginning uh, his time at Coppel. He returned to what was then Coppel and Standish Band in 2005. And uh, and yeah, he never, he never stopped banding, to be honest. Uh, but uh, a really, really iconic iconic figure in the world of brass bands. Um, I think if we did have to talk about a, a band, it would probably be Bickersha Colliery Band, who had a phenomenal run of success, um, you know, between 1935 and 1947 with three championships. A uh, bunch of seconds, thirds, um, and uh, so even in not only at Bellevue but in the nationals until they they closed it down um, during the war. Um, but ultimately, uh, you know, an amazing run, and suddenly it all stopped. And we'll talk a little bit about that uh, later. But uh, if you want to be that kind of a band, then there is no short cutting the the amount of effort, dedication, and and having the, the right people involved. And if you, you look at the list of musical directors, and it's another kind of top 10 list, they had William Halliwell, um, Harry Moss, uh, John Greenwood, Fred Mortimer, William Haydock. And uh, on top of that, for a period of time, they had Harry Mortimer, who was the man of brass. If you don't know uh, your brass bands, he is probably the greatest solo cornet and trumpet player, I think, of, of the time. He uh, was with Fordens, the principal cornet player with Fordens. He's, uh, he also moved then to the BBC, where he was responsible for evangelising brass band, making numerous recordings uh, over the years, many with Bickershaw and uh, even conducting uh, them at one of their uh, championship wins. But um, I suppose the story really, really is about uh, this man, is Major Ernest Hart, who was the band owner and managing director of the Bickershire Colliery between 34 and 49. He, um, he was a workaholic. I, I, th I think he was constantly 16 hours a day, uh, never stopped, and uh, he expected a lot from everyone and he expected Bickershaw to be number one, not anything less. And that drove a lot of the way in which uh, the band had to behave, how it began to, uh, to, to have a very clear goal for itself. It wasn't just about having a band, it was about being the best band in the country, which arguably was the best band in the world. He, you know, he did this through the way he treated his employees, the way he hired people. They brought people in from other bands and gave them jobs in the colliery. They, he also made the decision to lose the military style tunic, which was pretty much, a, you know, a, a hangover from the, the military band days, but also he believed um, quite uncomfortable to, to play in and, and also... Uh, not quite as elegant as the tuxedo look, which you can see in this image. Um, but those kind of decisions he made and uh, and was very, very much involved with the band in terms of his financial support and uh, 
and indeed his his input. He he never thought of himself as a musical man, but he 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 did understand how to get results not only in from his from the pit, but also from the band. <clears throat> and then attempting to achieve this, uh, he got William Haydock on board as bandmaster, and uh, the two of them had a a very very necessary relationship to 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 get to this point of number one um they had you know w william haydock was a very very talented teacher and bandmaster and uh working hand in hand with major heart uh they really did um they really did achieve it until until the band um the band folded um william haydock after that point went to <clears throat> start a band with the Wigan Boys Club, uh, his belief was was clear and and simple and quite correct that you you get young young people involved and uh, and they can only get better and better and better if given the right instruction and tuition, um, and so that's exactly what he did. He uh, he took over the Boys Club band and had a very very successful time, you know, taking young lads and turning many of them into into great players, so much so that. Um, <clears throat> they honoured him many many years later much of them much of them very 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 key players and um and uh, yeah just you know really re really taking time out to to celebrate someone who had kind of given them a wonderful opportunity by introducing them to 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 banding and in the end i suppose the question is you know why why would the the country's most successful band at that period of time, you know, just suddenly stop. Um, I did um, kind of read this this book, which is um, by Keith Hollingshead. It's a it's a lovely account of actually what happened during this period of time, and and the story's very very emotionally told through the private letters and communications between Major Hart and uh, and William Haydock about the band how it was progressing what needed to be done what to, you know what what had to stop uh, some sort of very very um, insightful view into into the the goings on you know sadly the, you know part of the reason uh, probably the main reason why the band the band stopped was due to privatization of the the coal industry and the ncb um and uh, i think major hart was very very happy very happy uh running the 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 pit very well and running the band very well and uh he really couldn't come to terms with uh, the nationalization side of it he was uh increasingly kind of frustrated with how things were going and uh, uh sadly he took his life in the end um but not before securing um the band itself you know passing on instruments to the players and the rest of them uh, passed on to William Haydock to start up the Wigan Boys Club Band, which was a very, very noble act as well. But a lovely little story and, uh, you know, a shame that one of, you know, one of the, the country, if not the world's best bands for a period of time from Wigan, um, you know, went to, had such a, a, a sad a, a sad and a short run. In terms of um, players, you, we have a couple of Wiganers who exceptional. Harry Mather uh, was a euphonium player and conductor and literally one of the true greats. Interestingly, Harry Mather didn't start off on euphonium. He played um, he played the horn with uh, Bickershaw and then he moved to Foden's uh, engineering where he picked up the euphonium and... Uh, was a complete wizard on it, and he, he, I think he does rate in the top 10 euphonium players of all time. The second one, uh, Teddy Gray from Aspel, uh, who was principal cornet player and a conductor, and uh, the words absolutely perfect to the words of uh, judges who heard him play for different bands at different times. He uh, Apparently, he, he no one ever heard him hit a bad note, whether it was in practice or on, or on stage. Um, a fabulous guy. He finished his uh, playing career and took on the baton, uh, conducting uh, and bandmaster at Wigan and District Brass Band, which is when I met him as a young boy. Um, and he took them 
the Wigan and District, he, he, he moved them up into the third section. I'm not sure at which point they got a national win in the third section, um, which I remember my uh, my dad being incredibly happy about. It was a great moment for him and the Wigan and District band and uh, and Teddy Gray was responsible you know, for bringing them up to that level um, uh, and winning winning the national championship. The back to Harry Mortimer again, who what he did also, he put together the All-Star Brass Band, which was um, his attempt at taking the best bands and the best players and bringing those together, of which Harry Mortimer and Teddy Gray were arguably the best of the best of the best in his all-star brass band and I again something for Wigan to be incredibly proud of. This by the way is a photograph of them when they were playing at Foden's and this particular quartet was incredibly successful. So you know that's kind of, that, that was kind of round about it I think the, the band the movement and uh, you know Wigan's part in it Um, you know I, I mentioned that or I may have mentioned that, that there have been over 30 bands in Wigan over the years <clears throat> And, um, you know, that's, that's the kind of makes sense because it's meant that a lot of different places in Wigan, whether you're in Pemberton, Hindley, Goldburn, you know, you, know it, it, you, you had your own band and they were there for you. They were there at the walking days. They were there at the church parades. They were there, you know, um, uh, <clears throat> playing uh, concerts um, throughout the year. And then you know, and and then going into into contests uh, and uh, and really getting the support of like local communities, um, you know, if we'd have had one um, one band uh, of the best of the best of all of those, I think we would have had one magnificent band, um, you know, possibly the best band. Who knows? Uh, the reason I, I'm showing Pemberton all wig and brass band here is is you know as of today. You know, we're, we're gonna, uh, Pemberton All Wigan Band is um, three bands. The A band, they're in the championship section. Uh, our only Wigan band, I believe, is in a champion section. The second band, the B band, is in the second section. And they have a youth band as well, which is great for players coming up. So, you know, any support uh, we can give to these people uh, is, is good, very good because they're our best bet under the baton of uh, Ron Dixon, who um, could get us a championship win. So let's see. Um, I'll finish off with, because I didn't go into too much detail about our, <clears throat> all, all the bands that we're gonna have over the years. So I've done a bit of a, a, bit of a slideshow, if you like. Um, and, you know, just to kind of take us out, uh, I thought it'd be, really good rather than me talk about how good Teddy Gray was as a cornet player to actually listen to him and he, this is him playing with Foden's Motor Works conducted by Rex Mortimer and they're playing the cornet polka brilliante but this is really just um a, a, it's a it's a it's a lovely look at all all the bandsmen of Wigan over the years um by by bands I think I've done it chronologically starting with the first one onwards and were I, I couldn't find photos for every every one of them. So if if you see a church instead of a band, that's because I couldn't find the photo. So I'd appreciate if anyone if anyone could fill in the gaps for me or or correct any kind of inaccuracies you may have seen. But uh, you know, hopefully it's uh, it's pretty much there. So uh, so yeah, enjoy this. It's uh, it's a nice way to kind of uh, kind of get out of this one. <laughs> 